Coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, shattering hopes for better inter-Korean ties. Pyongyang fires four short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea. This, as a South Korean missionary, claims he has been detained by the North since last October on charges of being a spy. North Korea agrees to hold Red Cross talks with Japan next month. The Japanese abductee issue and normalising the two countries' relations will be high on the agenda. Plus, addressing the country's ballooning household debt, the Korean government has called for more fixed-rate loans and principal interest repayments to slash the debt-to-income ratio over the next three years. Daybreak begins now. Thanks for joining us to all our viewers here in Korea and around the world at 6 a.m. on Friday, February 28th. Here in Seoul, you're watching Daybreak, and I'm Choi Yusun. We begin with the news that North Korea fired four short-range missiles into the East Sea on Thursday evening. Pyongyang's latest missile launch is believed to be in response to Seoul's annual military drills with Washington. Park ji has our top story. Korea's defense ministry has confirmed that North Korea fired off four projectiles, which are believed to have been Scott ballistic missiles, at 5.42 Thursday evening. The four short-range missiles were launched from North Korea's southeastern coast in an area called Gitteryong into the East Sea in a northeasterly direction. Gitteryong is a mountainous region with a missile launching pad and is located at some 40 kilometers south of the North Korean port city of Wonsan, North Korea's strategic and military foothold. South Korean Defense Ministry officials say the missiles are believed to have a range of some 200 kilometers. The ministry believes the missile launch was in response to the ongoing South Korea-U.S. joint military drills on the Korean Peninsula. It added that South Korean military forces are prepared for any possible provocation from the north. Meanwhile, Korea's YTN reported, citing government officials, that North Korea also fired off four projectiles from North Korea's eastern coast north of Wonsan into the East Sea in a northeasterly direction last Friday during the second day of the Inner Korean family reunions. The projectiles were believed to have a range of some 150 to 60 kilometers. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Also on Thursday, a South Korean national held a press conference in Pyongyang claiming he's being held in the north on charges of trying to overthrow the regime. Seoul has called on Pyongyang to repatriate the Christian missionary. Our Hwang Sung-hee reports. Kim Jong-uk, a South Korean missionary, entered North Korea on October 7 with Bibles and other religious materials in hand. The next day, he was captured by North Korean authorities and has been held against his will ever since. At a press conference in Pyongyang on Thursday, Kim said he had wanted to build an underground church in the North Korean capital. I advised North Koreans that I met in China to break the North Korean regime and build God's nation, and ordered them to build an underground church in the North. North Korea claims Kim is a South Korean spy and was plotting to overthrow the state. This claim was backed up by Kim, who testified that he received money from South Korea's spy agency in exchange for providing information about the North. The National Intelligence Service denied the claims Thursday, and it's worth noting that Pyongyang has a tendency to coerce statements out of its detainees. South Korea's unification ministry says it was notified about the arrest in November, but that the North refused to give details on the detainee. It was inhumane for North Korea to continue ignoring our repeated calls to identify and repatriate the detained South Korean and to only reveal his identity now. The ministry demanded that the North ensure Kim's safety until he is repatriated and to allow his family and lawyer to visit him in Pyongyang. It's rare for a South Korean national to be detained in the North, and the incident comes amid thawing inter-Korean relations. 
Experts expect Kim to be released sooner rather than later, as North Korea is known to showcase its detainees before sending them back home. But considering the unpredictable nature of the communist regime, the possibility of the South Korean missionary being used as a bargaining chip cannot be ruled out. Hwang sang Arirang News. While the future of inter-Korean relations remains to be in question, North Korea and Japan have agreed to meet for working-level Red Cross talks in China early next month, and this was announced by Japan's foreign ministry. During the seven days of talks starting next Monday, the Japanese Red Cross and its North Korean counterpart are expected to discuss repatriation of the remains of Japanese nationals abducted by North Korea. And speculation is rising that the two sides may even talk about Pyongyang repatriating Japanese abductees believed to be still alive in the north. The last Red Cross talks between the two countries were held in Beijing back in 2012. A top U.S. defense official says Pentagon's plans to cut the Army's overall troop numbers will not affect the number of U.S. troops here in South Korea. Speaking at a forum in Washington this week, Acting Deputy Secretary of Defense Christine Fox said the U.S. military operations in Korea will not be affected as it's crucial to ensure the security of the Korean Peninsula. She added the U.S. military rebalance to the Asia-Pacific region will also not change. Currently, there are slightly over 28,000 U.S. troops stationed in Korea. Earlier this week, U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel unveiled plans to cut U.S. US Army numbers by between 70 and 80,000. Former Japanese Prime Minister Tomiichi Murayama says Tokyo should scrap plans to re-examine its landmark apology for its military's wartime system of sex slavery. Asked about the, when asked about the Abe government's recent remarks on reconsidering the 1993 Kono statement, Murayama, who had also apologized for Japan's wartime atrocities during his premiership, said reopening the case would not do nothing but offend Koreans. Meanwhile, the Chinese government has decided to designate a National Memorial Day for the victims of the 1937 Nanjing massacre. Analysts say the move is part of China's protest campaign against Japan following Abe's visit to a controversial war shrine that honors several Class A war criminals. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world. Return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye plan given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home. Defense Ministry. The legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. Prime Minister Shin Do Abe said Tuesday. Korea's household debt recently surpassed one quadrillion won. That's roughly 930 billion U.S. dollars. To tackle the heavy debt, the government has announced policy measures to get the borrowers and lenders to bring down the debt faster. A Kim young reports. The government announced on Thursday a set of measures for tackling the country's chronic household debt problem. With Finance Minister Han Osok saying the government will be proactive. To bring the ballooning amount of household debt under control, the government has set a goal of lowering the debt-to-income ratio by five percentage points by the end of 2017. The debt-to-income ratio stood at 164 percent as of the end of 2012. The government said the debt-to-income ratio was near the mid-160 percent range at the end of last year. Economists view household debt as a persistent problem for the economy as it could affect domestic demand. To address it, Korea's financial regulator urged local banks to raise the portion of fixed-rate loans. The Financial Services Commission plans to push local banks to increase the portion of loans with fixed interest rates and encourage households to repay the principal and interest together. The regulator hopes to raise the portion of both fixed-rate loans and principal interest repayments to 40 percent by the end of 2017.
Financial regulators also said the growth in the amount of debt held by self-employed people or people using secondary financial institutions such as savings banks say it's a bad sign as people in this group tend to have higher rates of defaulting on their debt. Kim young Arirang News. You'd be hard-pressed to find anyone, especially a young person, a person here in Korea that doesn't use messaging app Kakao Talk. It's everywhere, so it might not come as a big surprise to learn that it's been spotlighted as the local internet company with the best brand value. Korea stock exchanges are lining up to attract its operator before it goes public next year. Connie Lee has more. Kakao Kao Corporation has set its sights on the market. Known for its popular messaging app, Kao Kao Talk, the company is preparing for an initial public offering next year in May on one of Korea's stock exchanges. Korea's tech-heavy cost tech market is already fighting to bring the developer to its stock exchange over the benchmark Kospi. According to industry insiders on Thursday, the cost tech has set up a task force to draw Kao Kao Corporation. This comes as Kao Kao said it is very close to signing a deal to hire Morgan Stanley and Samsung Securities as advisors for the IPO. Sources say that after the company goes public, its value could exceed 2 billion U.S. dollars. And with strong interest in the mobile messaging market, insiders say it has a potential to raise between a billion and 5 billion U.S. dollars. Kao Kao Corporation is Korea's dominant messaging platform, with Kao Kao Talk, which was released in 2010. With 133 million registered users, it is now one of the fastest growing mobile messaging services. And it earned its first annual profit in 2012 with its mobile games. Although it is facing fierce competition in the mobile messaging world, Kao Kao Talk is one of the most valued internet brands. Research firm Brandstock arranged Kao Kao Talk first over the popular Korean portal site Naver. It's the first time in 10 years that Naver lost the top spot. Kao Kao also ranked above the number three Facebook, Twitter, and Tao. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Most of Korea has been cloaked under a thick layer of fine dust over the past week or so, and the blanket of haze has people worried about the possible health effects. And to better monitor and forecast air quality here in the country, Korea may join hands with China. Our Shin Samin reports. As a mother, it's been really challenging keeping the house clean with fine dust particles everywhere. My skin also gets irritated when I go outside. I usually enjoy outdoor activities, but nowadays I try to stay inside unless it's important. It's been a little boring. They can feel it breathe it, and taste it, and they're not happy. The heavy drowning smog from China that has blanketed most of Korea over the past week continued Thursday. An air pollution warning was finally lifted Thursday afternoon, 75 hours after it was imposed by the government, which makes it the longest warning ever. At its highest level, the concentration of fine dust stood at over 170 micrograms per cubic meter. That's nearly triple the amount recommended by the government as being safe. The polluted skies have forced the elderly and the young to stay inside as the toxic particles can cause respiratory problems and chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. One local hospital in the southern part of Seoul has reported a 20 to 30 percent increase in respiratory patients over the past week. I've been coughing really bad for the past couple of days. I've even started to cough up yellow phlegm. So I now wear these masks and carry some in my bag as replacements. To better monitor and forecast air pollution in the future, Korea has turned to China for help. Environment Minister Yun Sung-gyu says Korea will jointly develop a new forecast model with Beijing to better prepare citizens for fine dust waves headed for Korea. Once it's up and running, the government will be able to use the data collected to improve the accuracy of its forecasts. The concentration of fine dust has dropped back to normal levels on this Friday, but the Korea Meteorological Administration says the poor air quality is expected to be a recurring problem as the annual yellow dust season nears. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Numbers show Koreans are increasingly opting to vacation overseas rather than here in Korea, but there's plenty to see and enjoy within the nation's borders. 
And the government is determined to remind them and everyone else of this fact. Our Connie Kim reports. Take a sneak peek at Korea's best travel destinations. Ahead of an 11-day travel week designated by the government in May, the Culture Ministry and Korea Tourism Association have launched a travel exhibition to give Koreans a better idea of where to spend their vacations. The exhibition kicked off with Korean fusion music with the culture minister, foreign ambassadors and Seoulites in attendance. There are a lot of good travel destinations in Korea. We want to inform and promote diverse places so that people can visit different places in the nation. Uh, for me, as the ambassador of Russia, it's of uh, great importance, especially this year, because uh, our two presidents last November, when my president, Mr. Putin, he visited Korea, they reached an agreement uh, on the uh, uh, special uh, regime for uh, visits. So uh, I am waiting for crowds of Russian tourists coming to Korea. From the city of Andong's famous Korean beef to Ulungdo Island's pumpkin taffy, the exhibition introduces a unique taste that different regions of the country offer. Visitors were drawn in by the exhibition's national park booth, where they got to walk on simulated park trails. One feature that highlights the ecology of the demilitarized zone was especially popular, offering visitors a chance to see something they normally can't. While there's plenty to do for adults, there's just as much for children to take in and enjoy. Archery was the most fun activity, and I learned that Gangwon-do has great scenery and lots to do. I want to visit Gangwon-do. With plans to encourage Koreans to travel more within the country, the nation's one and only travel exhibition will be welcoming visitors until March 2nd at the COEX Convention Center. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kwan Soa. Let's take a look at what's making headlines around the world. Thursday was another tension-filled day in Ukraine. Western nations are calling on Russia to help ease the turmoil in Ukraine's Russian-dominated region after dozens of armed gunmen seized Crimea's government headquarters. British Prime Minister David Cameron and German Chancellor Angela Merkel expressed their concerns, and U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel and NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen urged Russia to not take any steps that could be misinterpreted and escalate tensions referring to possible military intervention. In the meantime, ousted President Viktor Yanukovych is said to be in Russia, as Russian state news agencies reported he plans to hold a news conference on Friday. Back in Ukraine, Parliament approved of all new members of government, with the exception of two. Britain's intelligence agency has reportedly captured still webcam images of millions of Yahoo users, which include a large quantity of sexually explicit images. The Guardian newspaper reported on Thursday that GDHQ, with the help of the U.S. National Security Agency, gathered materials based on documents originating from NSA leaker Edward Snowden. A program called Optic Nerve made the interceptions possible and stored captures between 2008 and 2010. Yahoo said if the report is true, it would be a whole new level of violation of their users' privacy. In a bid to reunify the long-divided island Cyprus, Turkish and Greek negotiators held simultaneous exchange visits to Athens and Ankara on Thursday. The high-level peace negotiations are the first to take place in almost two years. No press was allowed in the meeting, but a Turkish newspaper quotes an official saying the talks were a positive start. Cyprus is divided since 1974 with the Greek Cypriot South and the Turkish Cypriot North, when Turkey sent military forces there in the wake of a Greek-inspired coup, which sought to unite the island with Greece. In the U.S., Arizona Governor Jan Brewer has vetoed a controversial bill that would have allowed businesses to refuse service to gay and lesbian customers. Brewer, a Republican, said the law could result in unintended and negative consequences, such as hurting the state's economy by driving away businesses. The state capital of Arizona, Phoenix, is the host city for next year's Super Bowl, and the bill raised concerns the event, which is likely to bring in hundreds of millions of dollars to the local economy, could be moved.
And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off in the LPGA, where world number one Pagin B went into the first round of the HSBC Women's Championship, hoping to win her first title this season. And after the first round, not a bad start. Pagin B off to a great start to start off the event, but shot an even par in the front nine before three birdies in the 10th, 13th, and the 14th hole. But the 17th hole, she would bogey, leaving her at two under 70 after the first round. Good for seventh overall, just trailing Kerry Webb by four strokes, who shot a six under on the day. And moving over to football, where fans have been waiting four years to find out how the Tegok Warriors will look on the pitch in Brazil, as the Korea Football Association reveals their uniform for the upcoming Brazil World Cup. But it wasn't the uniform that caught everyone's attention. It was what manager Hong Myung Bo said in the press conference. Now, speaking at Gwangamun on Thursday, manager Hong Myung Bo stated that the silver medal finished by the South Korean men's speed skating team pursuit team inspired him and Korean sports generally, stating that despite lacking the experience and technique compared to the other nations, they were still able to claim the silver medal. Manager Hong stated that the Korean World Cup squad is very similar to the speed skating team and hopes to do the same in Brazil. And moving on, it seems like yesterday when the 2013 Boston Marathon was marred by a terrorist attack when three spectators were killed, including 264 others injured. And the officials are now planning to make sure that doesn't happen again this year. The Boston Athletic Association, which organizes the 26-mile race, stated that all backpacks and handbags will be banned at the event. And for athletes planning to bring a change of clothes, they will be provided with a clear plastic bag to hold their items at gear check areas. Now, this year's event is set to take place on April 21st on Patriots Day. And now moving over to some Thursday night's KBL action where the Ursan Mobis Phoebus continue their dominance as they cruise past the Koyang Orions 79-54. Meanwhile, with the Incheon Itinland Elephants taking on the Busan KT Sonic Boom, let's take a look at the highlights. Now going into the game here, first quarter, both sides shooting well from the field as KT takes a 24-16 lead before going to halftime with a 34-29 lead. By the second half of the game, Incheon rallies back, outscoring KT 22-16 in the third before running away with it in the fourth quarter of the game as they rally back to take this game 70-63. And now finishing things off with some Thursday night's V-League action as the Korea Expressway dominated the Hungook Insurance Life Pink Spiders in straight sets 3 to nothing. Meanwhile, with Udikar taking on the lowly Russian cash vest bid, let's take a look at the highlights. And going into the game here, did I say lowly? Russian Cash looking like a different team in this game as they absolutely dominate Udi Kard in all offensive categories, including the blocking game as well, putting up 12 blocks compared to Udi Kard's three blocks. The Vespits capitalized on Udi Kard's mistakes as well, scoring 20 points on errors as Russian Cash cruised through three sets to nothing. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great weekend, everyone, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good Friday morning. Well, today will be slightly cooler than yesterday, but average high temperatures are expected to be in the lower teens, remaining slightly above normal temperatures for this season. And thankfully, ultra fine dust advisory was lifted yesterday here in Seoul and surrounding areas, so the whole nation can breathe cleaner air today. But we'll have clouds hanging over the peninsula throughout the day. In fact, more clouds will be rolling into our country as we head into the afternoon. And for this weekend, southern regions will receive another round of showers, which will start from Jeju Island tomorrow morning and then will spread to other areas down south. But upper parts of the country will have mild and dry weather conditions over the weekend. With that in mind, here are the readings for today. The morning low in Seoul starts out at zero, and afternoon high in the capital and Busan will get up to 12, and Daegu and Gwangju will top out at 11 and 14, respectively. Now, let's see how other regions are looking. 
It looks like Jeju will climb up to 11, and Daejeon will rise to 13, while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be at minus 2. Now that's all for me at this hour, and hope you have a wonderful Friday. Thank you, Jian, for that. And I also want to thank all our viewers for tuning in to Daybreak the past year. Our Mark Broom will be taking over the program starting next Monday. And in the meantime, stay with Arirang TV for more on the day's headlines.